Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of A Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Julio Vela. We're back, man. We another great week. Show tonight. Great show. Very excited. I'm very excited, too. Very excited. Because we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the sitting judge for Harris County Criminal Court at Law Number 8. He's running for re-election this year, Judge Jay Carahan. Judge, how are you? Fine, Jimmy. How are you? We're JV? great. I'm, I'm glad you could join us tonight. Good to be with you. Uh, you, I think, are now the third actual sitting judge we've had on this show. So we're, we're, we're moving up the ranks here. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting the actual sitting judges to come on this show. So uh, we're going to be with Judge Jay Carahan for the next hour, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be talking about a variety of issues, uh, about his reelection, about some of the issues that the candidates are talking about in this re-election, the issues facing the Harris County criminal justice system that we're all talking about, and it's not just an election issue, it's a countywide issue uh, that we're dealing with. So we're gonna be here for the next hour, like I said, 713-807-1794 is the number to call in. We'll open up those phone lines about 8.30 or so. We might open them up a little early. Uh, we also have Twitter up, at HCCLA underscore TV, so you can send us your questions and comments right here. But uh, Judge, let's just, let's get right into it. I mean, this is, you're, you're facing a very serious re-election campaign this year, not just from the, the what everybody's talking about, the, the challenge the Republicans might have from the Democrats this year, but you yourself are now locked in, in a primary race for the first time in a long time. I've never had a primary race like this, <laughs> except the first time that I ran in 2002, and it was for an open bench. There were three in that primary and I came out of that the three that group of three and became judge, but have not been challenged in the primary since then, until now. What are your, and, and, and before we really get into the, the nitty gritty of it, you, you've been on the bench a long time. How, how have you seen just politics in general evolve in the county? Well, politics in the county has uh, evolved uh, from uh, a place where 15 years ago, politics was kind of fun. And enjoyed it, enjoyed the challenge. But with each successive year, with each successive campaign, it's gotten more polarized. It has become more contentious. And it's not as much fun as it used to be. It actually, it, oftentimes, it's, uh, it's, it's painful. But it's a process, nevertheless, that we must undergo in order for the people to get to know who the candidates are. We still, despite the politics, have to go out and meet the people and let them know who we are what our qualifications are, and why we're running for officer or for re-election. That's, that's foremost. Judge, you said that politics has changed the way uh, you see things and has made things uh, painful. So what is it now that keeps you going? Well, I'm very, very committed to public service and have been for the greater part of my career as a lawyer. Um, I was adding up the number of years I have been in public service in my 35 years of licensure as an attorney, and I believe I'm somewhere in the 26 or 27 year range of, uh, uh, out of the 35 of being in public service, having started in the district attorney's office in 1980 um, as an intern in that office and an attorney in 83 when I was licensed through my time as a federal prosecutor for the United States Justice Department. Uh, and then uh, I returned uh, to uh, service uh, to the public when I was elected to this office as judge of County Criminal Court at Law Number 8. So um, it, it is um, a joy to be in service to the public. We, we need good people to serve the public in all of these positions, uh, folks who are committed, who have passion, and who are willing to look at innovative ways to make uh, criminal justice better and more user-friendly to the people. Do you find the same things that inspired you to run oh so many years ago, continue to inspire you now? Those and many, many more, <laughs> JV, uh, we, have, we are faced with great challenges in the criminal justice system now. You are aware of them. And uh, it, we who have experience and institutional knowledge in the criminal justice system um, should be there at the forefront looking at ways that will make the system better make it more available to the people, to make it more user-friendly to the lawyers, the witnesses, the parties that are involved in criminal justice. And so um, these new challenges, um, well, for instance, we're now using more therapeutic specialty courts. Uh, we didn't have those many, many years ago. Now we have them. 
Uh, we have a veterans court now. We have drug courts in, in uh, felony court. We have sober courts in the misdemeanor courts for the repeat offender DWI cases. We have the, um, the courts for um, uh, um, folks who are charged with prostitution cases uh, to help them um, work through those issues and, and, and make a better life for themselves. These are important pro projects, and, and so these, these are a relative newcomers to our criminal justice system. So um, because of that, um, more is expected of a judge. And so uh, it, it helps to have the experience and the institutional knowledge and the will to make those things come about. What, what do you say to those who, in response to what you just said, would say, we hear you about your institutional knowledge, but to some degree that can be a bad thing too, because there has been the argument by, by a lot that the people who have been in power who have held the benches, who have held the district attorney's office for a while, that they really don't want to change and, and that they're not open to change. What's your response to those people? Well, you can't say that about me. <laughs> <laughs> I have been open to change from the first day I took this office in uh, January of 2003. Uh, I began looking at uh, new ways of helping uh, folks get through this criminal justice experience and misdemeanor court so that they learn from the experience, move on, and uh, make better choices in life so they don't come back. And, um, you know, I began working with young people, uh, the 17, 18, and 19-year-olds back uh, when I t first took office, to have them come back and visit with me in court while they were on probation so I could check in with them and make sure that they were in compliance and that they were working well with the probation department. And I found that when they would come back every 60 days or so to visit with me, that sometimes the problems that arose in their probation were not their fault, but they were somebody's fault in the probation department, some misunderstanding or some misapplication of a policy. And so I was able to nip that in the bud early on so that I wouldn't be finding out about these things seven, eight, nine months into the probation when a motion to revoke was presented to me for signature. So we had an opportunity to work with them early on and do that. Now we use those same tools in the sober court, in the drug court programs, when uh, we meet with the probationers twice a month. In my sober court, I have one of five sober courts that we've established in Harris County. I meet with those proba probationers twice a month and check in with them and I know what's going on in their lives more. I know what's, what problems they're having with their compliance and I'm able to tweak the program in real time rather than find out after the fact that they weren't complying and, uh, and they were being subject to having their probation uh, revoked. Th I mean, that's not the right way to do this. We need to be checking in with them on these cases. If we're really serious about wanting successful probationers, the judges have to get involved. That, that means extra work, that means more uh, commitment to the process, and I certainly enjoy doing that. And, um, and another thing is, I mean, okay, I'm 62. You guys are techies, right? But but I, my court is a, a pilot court for the e-filing program that we're going to have in Harris County to make your life as a lawyer easier, make the uh, the defendants' lives easier, so, so that it, it will prevent people from making unnecessary trips down to the courthouse to have an order signed. You can do it online eventually. And so we are doing e-document um, administration, and that's coming very, very fast. It's, it is reality now. Yeah, I and, just filed some stuff today for, for a case that I have set for tomorrow. I went ahead and filed a notice of appearance and mm -hmm. filed my uh, discovery request all today. So I'm walking into the first thing already set to go. I mean, I, I, I love it. I hear a lot of complaints about that the e-file system doesn't work right. I get my filings kicked back. I mean, it just, it's, it's adaptation for everybody. Everybody needs to learn how to do it. Agreed. And, and the judges are learning. We're, we're going to meetings where we're getting training from the clerk's office. They come to my courtroom and, um, and showing me how, how the deeds program works, how to go on it and sign documents, how to pull documents up. And so we, we are learning to do that. So you can teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> and, and, and it's important that you teach people with institutional knowledge these new tricks because then we can give you the benefit of that institutional knowledge plus the new knowledge we pick up with the new training. Another thing that we're, we've learned since I've been a judge is we've, we've gone to seminars uh, you know, early on in my judicial career presented by neuroscientists and we're learning about what addiction really means. Addiction is a disease. It changes the brain chemistry. We judges are, are learning in, within the last 15 years 
that uh, we have to, um, to work with the patient, if you will, mm -hmm. so that they can um, move ahead and, and get past their addiction. And there, there's two steps forward, three steps forward, and maybe a step back from time to time. And we have to learn how to be patient with that rather than just sign a motion to revoke probation for one dirty urine. We need to bring them in and find out why the urine is dirty, uh, what, what's causing them to want to, re, uh, to use drugs again or alcohol again, and work on that from the uh, therapy side of it. Uh, it's not it's not a hug a judge judge program which some people have called it. It's called good criminal justice, good accountable criminal justice using evidence based practices, Jimmy. Yeah, and and I mean, uh, I know we've all seen it through the system. I mean, sometimes with people who have addictions, it takes more than one trip down there. I mean, it it might take them their second or third charge that they get filed against them to, before they get that wake-up call. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, sometimes it may be the, 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 the yeah, serious like charge. A, yeah, the, the, the bad wake-up call, wake up call. Yeah, right. um, sure for them. And, and so uh, what, do you, what do you feel, on top of what's already been done, what do you feel can be done in addition um, to add to these kind of things? Uh, to, to help people. I mean, how, how can you expand upon those? What, what would you like to see done what, if, if you're reelected? What would you suggest or implement in your court? Well, um, I would like to convince more of my colleagues to take on a sober court. You know, we, we could use uh, two or three more sober courts in Harris County um, because um, we do have this, uh, this reputation um, undeservedly or deservedly, whichever way you look at it, of being the, the deadliest county in the country for alcohol-related traffic fatalities. And, uh, and DWI is right there at the t near the top of the list for the filed cases that we have in Harris County. So we need more course, courts for um, repeat offender DWIs and problem probation DWIs where somebody's have a problem. We need to get them into maybe a, a, a middle sober court for somebody that's not quite a second offender but that's heading, to, heading towards being a second offender. And um, so we want to, and, and the whole process makes the street safer, you know, for, for everybody else. So I'd, I'd like to see more of the programs. Um, what are some yes. advantages of the of the sober court program? I'm, okay, so you're going to treat, uh, I suppose, some of the more symptoms yes. or some of the circumstances that causes an individual to use alcohol, amongst others. And what are those other things? I mean, I think I understand that uh, occupational license filing fees might be helped with. Mm -hmm. Is there a, what about the end result? I mean, are are there helps with fees and helps with what steps are also taken to help that individual get back on their feet record-wise? Well, Sober Court is a four-phase program. Okay. And when they get into the first phase, I mean, it is quite intensive. And they don't get the use of their car in the first phase. And they have to earn that by being compliant and going through all the work that, that's required to be in Sober Court. Go to their therapy sessions, meet with their probation officers, do whatever classes they're required to take. And we help them with the fees and the, and the costs and all of that during that whole process. I mean, a lot of these things are, are now mandated by the state. You know, counties our size are required to have a, so, a sober court or a DWI repeat offender court. So um, that, that's what goes on. There's, there is more focus on the individual and their rehab. Okay, and let's look at the name of sober court, saving ourselves by education and rehabilitation. That's what sober means in our moniker. And the, these folks go through this program, and there's a whole team of folks. It's not just the judge. It's the probation office. It's the therapy session individual. We have sheriff's deputies that go to the home and visit people and check on uh, to see if there are bottles in trash cans. Mm. And, they, and they sign waivers uh, saying, yes, they can come in and, and, uh, and look around and, and meet with them. Okay? And, and so we have this support group. And it's not like we, they, they go up down there and kick the door in and look for bottles. They, if, if they find something, they report back to the team manager. The team manager reports back to me. And we don't wait for that, uh, that group session every two weeks. Sometimes we bring somebody in on an off day, and they come meet with the judge. And we figure out, what, what is the problem? What's going on? Is there something happening in your life that's making you want to drink again? And we're finding that uh, people have these little buttons that, that are pushed in their life by something or somebody that makes them uh, want to drink again, and we try to get to the, the root of it. And so we work, work through that. Can you talk about the four phases and what they are and how one maybe goes through the process? Well, they get in the first phase, and, and, and the phases are usually from, uh, they're usually about two to three month long phases. And when they, they pass into a new phase, they get a certificate and, a, and an add a boy or add a girl from the judge, and um, they, they're given new um, privileges. 
So it's like, you know, the child that proves to you that they are being compliant with your rules in the house. They get more privileges if they have misbehaved. So it's, it's what a good parent would do. And then they go through phase two and they get more privileges when they get into phase three. And then from, from phase three, they get into, uh, they, once they're in, uh, they go into phase four, they don't have to visit the judge anymore. They just see the person, the probation officer, so they don't have to come down so much and see the judge. And then after phase four, then they are released to go out to, you know, into the county and they will visit their probation officer until they finish their probation and graduate from the program. So with each phase, they get new privileges. They get their driving privileges after a certain point. They, uh, they, they, we give them credits for against community service if they've been doing good things. We take community service off the table. When they first get uh, sober court probation, they're given many hours of community service attached to the probation. And when they do good things, we give them vouchers for community service so they don't have to do 10, 15, 16 hours of community service if they've completed uh, their rehabilitation programs and, and, and the other requirements of the program. So they're rewarded. Is the, the program, I, you, you mentioned a team, is there a, a, a medical professional in the team and is the program backed behind uh, science or or curriculum that's like it, talk to you about that. It, it, the the American Bar Association has uh, 10, 10 rules that the sober courts uh, have to comply in order to be considered a valid and uh, and and reliable and 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 good sober court under their standards and we meet those standards in Harris County don't ask me to name them here because I I need I need my cheat sheet to do that right. but um, uh, it is an, our, our sober court program is nationally recognized by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals and we have judges that, that travel around the country teaching other judges how to do this. And uh, so it, it is evidence based. Uh, there, there's no medical person involved unless it's somebody needs to get a, med, a certain kind of prescription to keep them from drinking alcohol. That's in a rare case. So there are mental health persons. We have law enforcement persons. There's a, a criminal defense lawyer is assigned to a sober court so that an individual who needs to talk to the judge about something, if there's a problem, can talk to the defense attorney in confidence without mentioning it to the judge. And there's also a prosecutor there uh, at all of our meetings. So it's a full court press, if you will. Can you share, may you share any anecdotes of success stories? I mean, is oh. this, do you see this or, are, and people make it through? There are so many anecdotes of successes and that's, and I have to tell you, my sober court uh, docket is the most joyful time of my work day, especially after the move from the storm and, and uh, doubling up on, in these courtrooms. I know that's coming next in our conversation. But, um, you know, when I meet with my folks and I see the, the wonderful strides they're making in their lives and they're living better lives and they're, they're getting along with their family and they're getting along with their boss and they're, 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 they're being promoted at work, they're, they're finding jobs, they're, they're starting businesses, it's, it's just a joy to watch the results of this. And I think that the, the last stats that I have, and, and I'll be corrected by our statistician on this, but I think our sober courts... Uh, are producing 70, 75, almost 80 percent success rate in the in the finishing of the probations. Now that's really, really good. That's really good compared to the general success rate of uh, successful probation completions. So we're very proud of this. We have five courts. One is for all women. Uh, that's uh, Judge Bull's court. One is for all men. That is for that is my court. We have one for all young people. That's Judge Goodhart's court. We have one for people that. That, uh, that have to come and meet the judge after work because of work issues, that's Judge Smith. And then Judge Fleming handles the uh, uh, all Spanish speaking court. So we have something for everybody in our sober courts. Because Judge Fleming speaks Spanish. Yeah, I don't know how you've ever seen her speak, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. it's just, you know. You are one of the, the, probably the few judges here who's, who's seen all three facets of the game, so to speak. Uh, you'd, you'd probably be the equivalent of a, of a five-tool player in baseball. Uh, <laughs> to, I'm sure Brian Weiss would appreciate the baseball reference. Um, but you were a state court prosecutor, you were a federal prosecutor, you were a defense lawyer, and now you've been a judge for the last 15 years. Yes. So uh, you have a perspective uh, of all these different things. I mean, you, you're able to know what a state court prosecutor goes through. You've also seen the the high stakes litigation, criminal litigation that goes on in federal courts and can, you know, what's really at stake there versus what's at stake in, in, in the state courts. Uh, you were a defense lawyer, so you, you know what it's like to 
represent somebody before the courts, and now you're a judge. How, how do you think that all of that has helped you become the judge you are today? What, what I think those experiences have done for me is given me a 360 degree lens to look out into what we do in criminal justice. I am not uh, just looking in this narrow place in front of me, but I can see all around me the effects of criminal justice not only on the defendant and the witnesses, but also on the lawyers that practice in the court and the prosecutors that have to come to court and present their cases and investigate their cases, on the law enforcement uh, side of things, and, uh, and also on the medical, um, uh, mental health side of things. And I think my experiences give me the ability to um, hear you as a lawyer, to understand you, understand the fact that you have to get back to your office as soon as possible in the afternoon in order to meet new clients, in order to get your cases ready for trial the next day, so that um, it motivates me to want to be an efficient judge that doesn't waste your time, um, that will listen to you and give you a good decision, uh, a decisive decision, if you will, so that you can take it and work with it no matter what the decision is. And, um, and another, another hat that I, that I have worn is I, I was a mediator for seven years. And I mediated over, let's say, 80 or 90 civil cases. And what mediation taught me how to do was to get people together who are conflicted with each other and find out what it is that they really need and try to find a place where they can meet in the middle or someplace on common ground and get the case resolved. And I really try to do that. I spend more time doing that after discovery is complete. I try not to, to uh, uh, interfere in the discovery process, but to talk to the lawyers when they get to a point where they've evaluated the evidence in the case and, and they're, they're headed for a trial and they're not thinking about settlement or a plea. And I, I have ways of talking with them that do not violate the ethics rules and allow the lawyers an opportunity to think about their case maybe a little differently and, uh, evaluate and, and come up with a different decision on uh, and how to resolve it other than a trial. And, but sometimes we have to have trials, and we like doing that too, yeah, as and, you well know. And, and I'm glad you brought up the mediation point, because I, I made the point last week on the show, going back to our initial conversation about how politics has evolved, I made the point last week that I, I feel like both at a local level and a national level, that both sides have really run to the, the extremes. Yeah. And, and that we don't have those people in either party that are able to bring us together to work out a compromise. Um, and, 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 you know, I feel like that's part of what politics is, that you elect your, your person that you like, but at some point when they get to where they are, the office that they're in, they, are then, they then need to kind of come to the middle and, and, and find a compromise for all these issues. Because, you know, you've got, even though you, you may have been one party, once you get elected, you're there for everybody. So just because you're a Republican judge, well, you still have Democrats who are going to appear before you as lawyers. You still have Democrats who are going to come before you as defendants. I mean, at some point, you know, don't we just need to find with, with all these policies that we're all arguing over, bail, what to do about pretrial diversions, all, all these things, isn't at some point we just all kind of need to get in a room and, and figure this out and, and, and find a compromise, a mediation, so to speak? Is that a rhetorical question or a specific <laughs> question to me? Well, it's to me. I mean, you, you've, you've, you've been on the, on, the, on the front lines of all this stuff for, for 15 years now, and you've, if you've seen it evolve. I mean, I, I've seen it just kind of degrade, really, <laughs> over the entire time I've been practicing law. I'll tell you what I think about that, Jimmy. I think that when people go to extremes, they're going to a real comfort zone for themselves. Yeah. And uh, in order to resolve um, disputes and resolve differences, we have to engage with our opposition. And, so, and, and engagement is necessary in order to resolve um, uh, disputes and, and conflict. And sometimes engagement is painful. But we have to have the courage and the will to work through that pain and that, uh, that difficult place of engagement and, and, and disagreement. And I think if we do that more, uh, we will find that we can come to better decisions and come to a, a governance, a place of governance, which is where we need to be as a society. And so I'm willing to engage. I've always been willing to engage with my opponent. I've never shied away from talking to an opponent about a case, 
what, no matter what side I was on, whether I was a prosecutor or a defender. And to do so set, it makes it possible for you to resolve your situation without having to go through the battle of a trial. And yes, sometimes trials are necessary because they're disputes of fact. And when they're disputes of fact, sometimes if we can't agree on those, we just agree to disagree and let a jury of six people in a misdemeanor case or a jury of 12 people in a felony case hear those facts and give us their decision and we must live with those decisions, okay? So uh, uh, it's about engagement and people need to, do, to, to be more willing to be involved in engagement and, and I think we'd, we'd, we'd all be better off. Lawyers engage every day at that courthouse. Opposing counsel, defense attorney. Uh, prosecutor, opposing counsel. As a judge, what is your approach to judging this engagement and when in fact six people render a verdict and let's say it's guilty? How do you as a judge approach uh, the decision that you're about to make in sentencing, in determining conditions of probation, in determining what's going to happen to an individual in your court that will be just. I mean, I can't imagine the, uh, the thought process in that. Can you shed some insight into that? Certainly, JV. Once someone has been found guilty and, and has been convicted of a crime and has elected the judge to um, assess the penalty or punishment in the case, um, I believe it is the judge's um, profound responsibility to learn as much as possible about this individual and about the facts of the case and typically the trial will give the judge the knowledge of the facts of the case in, in its entirety. Sometimes we need to hear more and so I look to the lawyers to bring me more information about the individual or facts of the case that I couldn't hear in the trial, okay? And, and so I think that's the responsibility of the judge to learn that and to, and to know the law well enough and, and to know the law uh, of, of punishment well enough to have you know the the options generated to be able to paint the right picture for this person and what's to happen with them in their in their penalty phase if you will and so um, I want to know I want to know mitigation information I want to go I want to know aggravating information and I'm, I'm open to hearing all of it I don't all, when I hear from the prosecutor about their evidence and they're finished I always look to the defense and say do you have anything, counsel, to offer me that I need to know before I assess the penalty in this case? And, um, and the good lawyers bring me information. They tell me about the individual, their upbringing, um, any kind of um, mental health deficits, any kind of health deficits or issues that may have affected this individual. We have to take all that into consideration and come up with a good decision that, that society will accept and that this individual will need in order to move forward, whether it's jail time or, or or probation and at that point it is jail time or probation once they're convicted the diversion programs that's all done pre conviction as you know and that and so I, I expect the lawyers to be exchanging that kind of in, uh, information b b before they get into a diversion I mean that's what diversion is is y'all have talked with each other in the state and uh, come up with a, a good idea so that's how I do it the <clears throat> do you uh, find yourself putting on, uh, what hat are you putting on? I mean, you put on the mediator hat, you're drawing from experiences. At what point? Now, that's a tough, I, I'm trying to go through the thought process of a judge and that's why, I don't know, that's a tough, that's a, that's a tough job and you've been doing it for so long. How have you been able to maintain your even keel on the bench like that? I wear the mediator hat at the pretrial motion setting and at the pretrial conference setting. Once the case begins uh, at the trial, once, once the trial has begun, the mediator cat comes off unless the parties ask me to put it on. And as a trial judge, it is my singular duty to apply the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure so that the trial is um, hopefully uh, in a, a, a fine example of due process of law that, er, that not only the parties can appreciate, but that the appellate courts can appreciate should they be grading my papers after the fact. And so I need to make good decisions as a judge on the, on the law and the evidence and the procedure used in the case. And, uh, and so I become a technician. I become a trial technician, a referee, if you will, a uh, referee who will, uh, will not hesitate to throw a flag if needed 
and will not hesitate to withhold throwing a flag if it's unnecessary to throw a flag at the time. And so I'm, I expect good lawyers to bring um, uh, matters to my attention during a trial that needs to be uh, resolved by a ruling, if you will. Um, I will not coach either side on what to do with, uh, with the, their presentation of the case. That's not my business. My business is ruling about what's in front of me in that trial in that moment. You know, I know I've, I've tried cases in front of you. In fact, it must have been eight years ago, one of my very first trials was in front of you. And I recently found out that you, in fact, might have some records of how we did and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and like ideas on how to improve. And your court has always been open to a lot of lawyers. It's always been a trial court. So it's always been, if you're on a trial, we're going to try the case. And it's not going to, and it's going to be quick. So once, once it's time to eval and it's, it's, it's evaluation time, it's going to be trial, you're going to take a deal. But talk about, if you can, shed some light on uh, your experience with younger lawyers and some uh, feelings that you, would, you could tell some of us out there on, on the joys you get out of it or some. Of course. Um, misdemeanor court is naturally a place where young lawyers make their start in the practice of, of law in the trial of criminal cases. Of course, that's where the DA's office starts their young lawyers when they begin their career. And that's um, no different for the defense attorneys. And so what I started doing in 2003 is keeping a running log of what, of what I call trials do, trial do's and don'ts. And um, when, when, and I have this up on my computer at the at the uh, at the bench. And when I see something that a lawyer does that's really effective, or really not effective, in fact, count, counterproductive to their case, <laughs> I make a note of it, and then I will edit that later so that I have a nice nugget of knowledge. And uh, I, I have about 20 pages of this stuff now, and I've actually broken it down into topics. So I have topics called examination, or argument, or discovery, or um, cr cross-examination, or um, opening statements, things like that. And when a lawyer comes back to me, and, and the good lawyers do this, after trial they come back to chambers and say, Judge, how did I do? And I, I invite them in, I said, well, I'm really glad you asked that. Have a seat. And I have some notes for you. And I will give them the notes that I took and say, you know, you did this and I thought that was really good in your case. But you did this later on in the case that totally um, uh, neutralized what you did earlier. Why did you ask that one too many questions, et cetera? So these are little things that, um, that I'm happy to d uh, do with young lawyers. It is mentoring, and that's one of the great joys of this job, is mentoring young lawyers as they make their start in criminal practice. I, in 15 years, I've seen lawyers start very green in their practice, and they are now some of the greatest lawyers in the courthouse trying cases over in felony court. Prosecutors have gone up to special crimes and become district court chiefs and have gone out and had stellar careers as criminal defense lawyers after they left the DA's office. Uh, it's a joy to watch this evolution of, uh, of, of law practice coming out of the misdemeanor courts. We are just past the 8.30 half hour of this show, so we're going to open up the phone lines if you have some questions for Judge Jay Carahan. 713-807-1794 is the number. I also still have Twitter up. It's silent, ladies and gentlemen, so hit us up with some questions. At HCCLA underscore TV. Um, all right. I guess we got to get into this. And who is going to make me be the one to ask it? <laughs> <laughs> this has been um, the campaign. Uh, it has been contentious. Um, you have uh, drawn an opponent in the primary. Uh, there's been websites put up. Uh, there's been some mudslinging on social media. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, gotten, it's gotten to a point where some have said and made accusations of, uh, you know, everything from uh, <clears throat> ethical violations to, to just downright nastiness. Um, what, what do you want to say to those who have criticized you and the way you've handled your campaign so far? Well, what I want to say is this. I never imagined that I would be in such a campaign in all the years I've been a judge and running politically for re-election. This was the furthest thing from my mind this year. And when I drew this particular opponent, and when this opponent um, right out of the gate went negative against me uh, in 2017. I was astonished and, uh, and, and very dismayed. 
Uh, but I, I found myself um, having to make the very difficult decision of whether or not I was going to let him use me as a doormat to get into the courthouse, or is I going to respond with the facts and the truth that, uh, that I learned during my um, opposition research about my opponent. And so I chose to, um, to launch a website uh, that people could refer to um, and to learn about him, learn about the, the, the facts about him. Uh, and this, was, um, this website uh, has documents that I have found that are in public record. This website has um, uh, public information that uh, comes from the district attorney's office, from evaluations and the records that he had while he was working in the district attorney's office. And everything in that website is based upon documents and facts that we have uncovered in public records and court records, um, uh, transcripts, affidavits given to me by a number of lawyers who have dealt with my opponent um, uh, while he was a prosecutor in that office. And I put that out th uh, there for people to see. And so what, what the website allows me to do is, while I'm campaigning, to talk about my bona fides and about my qualifications and not dwell on his lack of qualifications and concerns about whether or not he can uh, sit as a judge and be respected uh, as I have been for the 15 years. And so um, I'll let people look at the website and, and decide for themselves whether or not he is qualified and fit to serve as a judge. Um, I'm not going to get into that now, but I believe that I have the qualifications, the maturity, the experience, and the integrity to continue serving in this position for another term. And I think if folks really take a look at the facts of this, of, of, of our campaign, they will see that I am the most qualified person for this, the most fit person, and, uh, and that they will choose wisely by voting for me in the Republican primary, and again, hopefully in the general election in November. I want to ask this question of you, and, and I'll give you a little, as much leeway as you want to answer it. But uh, <laughs> because, well, because one of the things, and, and, and I've noticed this, we've had a couple of the candidates on, and and, and um, both on the Democrat and the Republican side. And what I've noticed, and, and I've noticed this for years in being and practicing in your court, and what I've noticed tonight is a lot of the things we talk about is judicial temperament, and you know you've you've been very even keel. As, as we've thrown uh, some questions at you, and, and it, you've been very even keel when, when even this subject has come up. I, I want to get your thoughts about what happened last week in, in Michigan with the judge in the Larry Nasser sentencing. Uh -huh. um, and there's been, a, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, whether, and, and there's been articles written by federal judges, by state court judges that I've seen out there, um, a, a lot of criticism of the way she handled the sentencing. Uh, in that case. I, I, I personally, I mean, I, I've, I've had clients who have pled guilty before you. I've had clients who have been convicted after a trial, you know, in front of you. I've had clients who've gotten acquitted in front of you. I've, I've had the full spectrum. Not once have I ever seen you be disrespectful to a defendant. And, and so I, I just want to get your thoughts on what you witnessed last week in Michigan. What I heard that judge say in, in Michigan in the Nassar sentencing should never come out of a judge's mouth, in my opinion. Um, to tell somebody, I have just signed your death warrant, is beyond the pale. A judge during sentencing should just stick to the facts of the sentencing, the facts of the case, and just assess the sentence and say, I'm sentencing you to all of these years because of these repeated violations of law, these repeated crimes that have been shown beyond a reasonable doubt you committed. And in the interest of justice, I am sentencing you to this to, make, to send a message to you, to send a message to the public general, for general deterrence, uh, that this is absolutely in, improper behavior. It is behavior that no society should ever put up with. And I hope you think about this um, while you're serving your sentence. Something like that is, is good to say. But to, to go that far to say I've signed your death warrant when it was not a death penalty case, yeah. I'm very sorry. But that's, uh, that's, that is, uh, that's stepping outside the line in my, in my view. How do you control yourself as a judge? Now, this goes back into your experience. Um, how do you control yourself as a judge, because you are a human being, from going to those? And... To, to stepping out of bounds, 
because we've all lost our temper, right? And, and we always say when, when we walk into the courtroom, the thing is, is holy. It's, it's sanctimony. It's, 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 it's sacred. But at the same time, I've known to, that I have been on the edge to, to go outside those bounds. But as an attorney within the court, we respect those bounds. Um, but how as a judge have you been able to and what are some things that, um, that help you? Keep yourself leveled because as a judge, you see these things and, you, and you, you're involved in, in cases that affect a lot of people. The first thing and the first thought in my mind that keeps me from crossing the line is to remind myself that I am not invisible, that I'm being watched. What we're doing in the courtroom is being watched by the people. It's being watched by the world. And criminal justice is only as good as the respect and the belief that people in the community have in the criminal justice system. So when a judge makes the system disrespectful by their actions and by their behavior, it, it diminishes criminal justice. Every judge must remember that. We are being watched. Num number two, yes, we are human beings. And yes, there will be events that come up from time to time in the context of a trial or even a hearing or even a plea hearing that uh, will we'll get the blood pressure up a, a little bit. That's what a judge's chambers is for. That's what a recess is for. And there have been times when I have been to that point and I would just simply say to the parties, the court is in recess, I'll be back in five minutes and I will go into chambers, I will look out my window, look into the sky, make a phone call, call my wife, uh, and do something that uh, takes me away from the moment reflect on what just happened and come back and come up with something to say rather than being reactive but being proactive and making the system respectful in the way that I handle that situation. We got a phone call coming in. Let's uh, let's head over to the phone lines. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Help. Hi, uh, Judge Carahan, thank you for being on the show tonight. Th thank you very much. So Judge, I think that being a judge is a pretty noble job. Do you ever invite young children or the youth of our community to come into the courtroom? Yes, I do. Since I've been a judge, we have hosted thousands of students, uh, typically of seventh or eighth grade or higher, to come observe our courtroom and uh, observe um, a docket call and even trials. And um, the clerk's office in, uh, has partnered with the courts to bring many of these students. Uh, I commend uh, District Clerk uh, Chris Daniel for setting a pro uh, up a program to bring the students into the courtroom. So we have students, we have scouts uh, come. Uh, we, in the summertime, when the, uh, the scouts are home for the summer, they, they are at the uh, Museum of Natural Sciences, and they come over to work on merit badges and things like that by coming into court. And so we talk about the Constitution and the... And the uh, the organs of, of the judicial system so that they understand what happens in, in a criminal court. And all in the process of explaining criminal justice, we also talk about making good choices in life and, and how consistent good choices lead to success and how consistent bad choices lead to failure. And so I like to think that we have touched many of these young people's lives. I get letters and photographs that they took with, uh, while they've been with us, sent back to court. They were hang hanging on the walls the last time I left the Criminal Justice Center. And it is gratifying to know that the young people are interested in our courts and are not afraid of our courts. Many of them have made decisions over the years to go to college, become lawyers, police officers, probation officers, and judges. So I, I hope to see some of them as colleagues someday. I'll be honest, I want my kid to have a little fear of the courts. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly do. Well, they used to be. They used, <laughs> I really, they used to say, I really want my son to have that fear in him like I had. <laughs> well, take, take, what, you want to see the holdover? Exactly. You can see the holdover, and the kids would be like, no, <laughs> oh, I'm never coming back, which yeah. is great. So, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about our situation here in Harris County post Harvey uh, with trials, with uh, building space. So uh, I, the Chronicle reported that it might be till 2020 that we might have some sense of, of, of normalcy, so to say. Um, what's your take on it? Uh, and is 2020 realistic? I, I can't give you the answer. We, we have a, um, a, a small group of judges who are presiding, our presiding judge, uh, Judge Fleming, and uh, some of the former presiding judges are working with county officials to expedite the, um, 
the restructuring of the Criminal Justice Center. Uh, we have been asked for um, uh, suggestions. Each of us uh, judges have been asked for suggestions on how to improve, how to make it more user friendly. Uh, as soon as I got that suggestion sheet, I filled it out that same afternoon and sent it in because I have lots of suggestions. Um, but where we're at now, we, we have moved into the Family Law Center. I want to thank my Family Law Center judges and associate judges for the courtesies and that they and their staffs have extended to us to let us use their courtrooms. Uh, each of us share a courtroom with one other judge, which means that we are working in shifts. And that makes it very difficult on the bar to come in and handle their cases. It also means that we can only uh, have a one week a month to try cases. My trial week for the month of February is next week. And I have something like 10 or 12 trials set on Monday. Now, I don't think they're all going to go, but we will hopefully try two or three of them next week. And I won't have another go at trials until March. This is, this is not good. I mean, I'm used to being in trial once or twice a week in, my, in the courtroom that we left in, in the Criminal Justice Center. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit frustrated uh, by that. But we are managing, JV. We're doing the best we can. But um, it is, it is getting, it's getting tiring and it's getting a little fatiguing to have to do it this way. I'd like to have regular work hours again, and, and you know it's uh, it's frustrating. But we are hopeful that the uh, that our that the county commissioners and our and our judicial leaders are are going to get us into a, a, a criminal justice center that will serve everybody again, and not have the lines wrapped around the building to, you know, during the inclement weather and so forth. That's there's no cause for that. That should never happen. I know um, I know our producers had a jail case go to trial. I have some coming down the pipeline. Um, how are we getting uh, people in custody to a jury trial? Is that happening or are the bails? Uh, we used to be jail cases got preference. They still do. They still do? Yes, sir. That, okay. And are they there? And we have the, the trial in the, in the designated courtrooms? Yes, sir. Wow. Well, they're not in the courtroom that I'm, I'm sharing with uh, Judge Derbyshire right. right now. We go to the seventh floor and there is a designated courtroom for trials on the seventh floor. Um, court 8 will have a jail trial first up on Monday. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know if it's going to go or not, but uh, they, they will have priority over the other cases, and that's by local rule, JV. And uh, so once we're finished that one, then we'll get the oldest case next that, that's up to bat, so to speak. And I'll, I'll, I'm trying on seniority of cases now. And I think that's only fair to the lawyers who have been preparing and waiting all these months to get their case to trial to do it that way. To set a jail case, I have, I, I have a jail case that's coming up, but to set a jail case um, and well, let's say we're in jail and the, the judge out of that court's not presiding, um, it's my understanding that we, have, we should go to the judge that that case is out of to set that, to put it on that court's docket. Is that right for the, for the jail time? Correct. The jail if, if that jail case is pending inside that court, then you work with that judge and that judge's coordinator to get that docketed for trial at the, at the, at the earliest opportunity. Speaking of e-files, going back to that e-filing, um, what about motions that happen spontaneous, that, that maybe the court reporter is not there or maybe we can make it orally? Um, do we have the ability to e-file a motion in court, uh, scan it, send it to you, and you sign at the bench. Yes. Wow. See, that, we're trying to figure that out. That's coming. That, that is coming. I've seen um, two computers in a lot of the uh, county criminal courts and law, and they're supposed to work as the kiosk. Is that, I mean, is all of that's going to be tied to your bench, and we can type out a motion that's sent to you and signed that's going to happen through all? Is that the plan? That's the plan. That's the plan. I, mean, I, gonna I, am, I am currently <laughs> signing um, a good 70% of my orders online now on, uh, at the, on the computer. And, and, and it will come to pass, JV, that um, I will have the ability to sign orders away from the courthouse if I'm traveling on vacation or traveling on uh, conference work. Um, I will be able to, uh, I will have the ability in time to be able to, to sign that with a keystroke. What, have you heard any uh, rumors or ideas on how to address the following situation? Let's say it's a magistrate order, magistrate's order for emergency protection and the address is wrong mm -hmm. or the, the complaining witness is wrong, the name. And usually now we just scratch it out and write it over and initial. But when it all goes e-file, 
have we figured out how to do that? Or have you thought about, uh, do you have, you, you know any rumors on that? Well, I'm, I, I, <laughs> rumors? We don't hear rumors at the court. No, rumors, do we? No, <laughs> no, we've no, never no seriously. Heard such things. Um, the the motions have to be handled by the lawyers themselves. So okay. um, when uh, and I always tell lawyers, if you give me a properly drawn order on your motion, I will look at it and sign it if it's a properly drawn order. But if, if there's a mistake in the motion, I won't know the mistake. You will, as the lawyer. Right. So that means you're going to have to communicate with uh, with your opponent, with with the prosecution, to make sure that it's correct. And if it's incorrect, uh, you you should get it resolved at that point before you send me the order. Well, just a little nugget. So. Most PDF programs have an editing function if you get the full suite. Mm -hmm. And like I was in civil court, we had a, a discovery issue, and the order that was, the proposed order that was filed didn't have anything in it. And we needed to make changes, so Judge Matthews actually was able to edit the order right there simultaneously and signed it right there and, and did it. So there is a way to do it. Um, I, I, just, I've seen Judge say this order is not not right. I'm not signing this. I've seen right. that. If it's incorrect, I hand the order back to the See lawyers it. and say the order is incorrect. Give me a correct order and we'll go from there. It's, I think that it's, it's the lawyer's responsibility to make a proper order. Civil cases are different. You know, I think civil cases in, involve uh, different issues, but when it involves constitutional issues, the parties really need to put their heads together. And when I say parties, I mean the defense counsel and the prosecutor to make sure the order is correct because it affects not just the individual, but it affects you know, the rights of, uh, of people constitutionally often. We've got a phone, another phone call coming in. Let's jump over to lines. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hi, thank you for taking my call. And uh, thank you, Judge Carahan, for answering questions tonight. You're um, I had a question about something that uh, you guys talked about earlier in the show uh, when you mentioned the advancements in neuroscience and the education that we're uh, receiving about <coughs> addiction and how it's a disease. And uh, when you discuss sober court, my understanding of sober court is that it results in a conviction even if the person successfully completes it. And I was wondering um, what your thoughts might be on changing that, if we could change that in the spirit of helping somebody make a new start or potentially getting work without having that conviction on their record. And then I also wanted to ask a question about MOEPS, but I'm happy to wait if uh, you want to address them one at a time. I'd like to address that one at a time. Your question is a very good one. Um, but it is a public policy question. And that, that's a question that needs to be resolved in the legislature. It's not resolved by me as a judge. I have to go with the Texas Penal Code and the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure. And for now, DWI results in a final conviction unless it was a diversionary sentence like pretrial intervention. And uh, so that's, that's the dilemma that, uh, that you are facing in that question. So I suggest that um, you have a conversation with your legislator and talk about other ways of, of resolving DWI offenses uh, that, um, that, that, that may go along with what your suggestion uh, may be. So uh, I, I, I work with the system as I now have it, and I, don't ch I can't change the system. That's changed in Austin. I, I've uh, seen a new form that goes with straight probations. It's the, I guess it's judicial clemency or uh, where the, there can actually be a set-aside? A DWI can result in a, uh, in a, uh, a non-disclosure order. Uh, the, the legislature passed that in the last session to allow uh, individuals with DWI convictions uh, that have um, so less than a 0.15 blood alcohol concentration and so much time has passed, they can get that uh, ordered non-disclosed, which means that the only people who can find that uh, would be law enforcement or somebody who is trying to get through a federal background check uh, and then those folks would find it but it would not be generally subject to public disclosure. That's, a good, that's, that's an advancement that helps individuals trying to find work and, and move on with their life. But um, the MOEP question, I'm very interested in that because a good number of our cases are domestic violence cases. Would you ask that question please ma'am? Yes sir and thank you for responding. Um, I'm not sure how you can answer this one or to what extent that is. Um, in, in Harris County, MOEPs or emergency mortar, orders for emergency protection are granted routinely in assault family violence cases. And I was wondering your thoughts on what you'd like to see in your courtroom from lawyers or out in the community when uh, complainants, maybe if they have children with defendants who are 
accused of assault, family violence, and they are asking for these orders not to be in place. And that creates a difficult position, understandably, for the court. Uh, what are some things that you would like to see happening and instead of granting the, the MOEPs uh, automatically? And I'll take your answer off air. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I probably encounter one to three emergency order orders of, of protection motions for those every day. And I, I always ask the prosecutor to give me the facts. Uh, I'm amazed at how many of those emergency order motions are not contested by the defense and they're just signed before they're even handed to me. So if it's uncontested, I go ahead and sign them. But if there's not been an agreement uh, and the defendant has not signed it be before the motion and the order is handed to me, I always ask for the facts of the case and the background of the couple. <clears throat> and I always give the, um, the prosecutor gets to go first because they're the movement. And I always look to the defense afterwards and say, do you have any evidence for me, counsel? And so uh, the, uh, the defense attorneys, when they're prepared on those, will tell me, well, this couple, is, they came to court together today and they, they seem to be patching things up and they're, they're living together, they want to remain living together, uh, et cetera. Uh, or, and they'll give me some other facts. So I am, uh, I'm, at, I'm happy to amend the prosecutor's order that they've given to me to delete the part where they can't live together. Uh, but I do maintain the part that says that they, they cannot, the, uh, the, uh, the defendant, the accused, cannot commit violence, com uh, domestic violence, stalking, uh, communicate in threatening or harassing manner uh, directly or indirectly through third parties and cannot possess a firearm. Those I will keep on those. And, um, and so nobody's going to talk me out of doing that. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the part where they want to stay together, um, if, if uh, it's established to me that there's not an immediate threat, and I always like, then I will I'll take that off and I'll actually talk to the complainant when she's in the courtroom or he's in the courtroom because it's both sides and I'll ask them what they want and, I, and we get them under oath to give me testimony and I'll take that and I'll make a note on the docket sheet or the order that they were there and I will adjust those accordingly as needed on a case by case basis. Campaign trail, hmm? how's it going? You holding up? Uh, I tell you what, I, I, I'd like to get some more sleep, but uh, uh, I, I got my second win and I'm ready to go towards March the 6th, my friend. What's, we, got, we got about a minute left here. What's the, what's the one thing, uh, most important thing to you that you want everybody out there to know uh, going into this primary? I want, you? I want people to, to remember that their judges should be independent, should be wise, should be knowledgeable, should have good temperament and uh, should be um, explaining the process to the, 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 the uh, parties that are in court, to the lawyers, to the defendants, and for anybody that's watching in the courtroom. The courtrooms are open and they need to know that the criminal justice system is a system that is respectable and is reliable and we have good people working in the system to make the system do what it was meant to do and that was provide a fair place to try cases and to provide a place where justice can be found on a daily basis and that's what I intend to do that's what I've been doing from day one and I intend to, to do it for another term in office if the people see fit to give me another term in office. And with that that's all the time we got ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we want to thank Judge Jay Carahan for joining us tonight, and we'll be back next week. Do we have a guest for next week? Working on it. Working, working on, on it. it. We're working on it, ladies and gentlemen. We'll have somebody here next week. We'll have somebody in the hot seat. But uh, that's, all the, that's all the time we have for tonight. They're bugging me in my ear, ladies and gentlemen. So we got to get out of here for Julio Vela and Judge Jay Carahan. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week.